Okay, so um, last week I talked about how we're probably going to be on, on um, the idea of goodness uh, for two weeks, but as I was getting today's lesson finished, I realized that it would just be too long. And because of the more philosophical nature of this one, I, I thought that that would just be too long. So we're, we're just turning it into a three-week three thing, and then we'll go to Obadiah the week after, so October 19th instead. So just a summary of what we talked about last week, no one is good, not even God's people. Uh, there's this idea that, you know, Christians are better than other people, that we have to be better than other people. That's just, that's just wrong. God alone is good. Um, Jesus made that absolutely clear. Um, second off, um, we learned that Christianity is not about being good. It's not about being better. Um, and then we, we looked at the, at the thing of, so what is goodness and, and why is that thing good? Um, and then um, we looked at the three typical answers. Do whatever you want so long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Do whatever you want and just keep your conscience clean. That the, all of those are insufficient. So... Um, we're going to continue on with the more, I guess you could say, speculative. We're just going to kind of look at some questions and um, just kind of think about them a little bit. Not really looking for answers for a lot of these things. And we'll just kind of elaborate on some things and see how that goes. Uh, first off, and we looked at this starting last week, how much good undoes bad? We, we looked at this. There is no m amount of good that can undo bad. If you murder someone and do a bunch of good things, the person's still dead. No amount of good things bring that brings that person back to life. They're still dead. But the opposite of that is just as important to ask. How much bad undoes good? Now, on the surface, it sounds like the same question, just a little bit, you know, backwards. But actually, it has way, way, way different implications. Think about how much bad undoes good. So I, I've done, I've done a bunch of good things, but now I'm doing some bad things. Is that okay? Well, the thing is, is a little bit of bad lowers your standing with people. You know, if, if let's say you're, you're, you're a nice person, right? But you start doing some bad stuff, some underhanded stuff, like, um, like here's a good example, okay? We're, we're doing the pies for the Apple Festival, okay? Everybody's used to us. They're like, hey, these people do a good job baking pies. So we start cutting corners and undercooking the pies. They get all gooey. They taste bad. We, we don't use good ingredients. We stop, we stop you know, uh, cooking them uh, uh, in the, under sanitary conditions. It just – things go bad. There's like cat fur on them, for instance, on top of the pizza. I mean we're talking about some gross crap going on, right? Um well, it's not going to take very long before we've lost our standing of having good pies. In fact, it actually – the bad things you do kind of seems to add up quicker than the good things you do. Um, but no amount of good can erase the bad. So we looked at that. Now, once again, though, let me just clarify before I go a little bit further here. When I talk about good in this context, I'm talking about good as in doing a good thing. I'm not talking about righteousness. We're going to look at righteousness, how much righteousness – erases evil and that kind of stuff in just a minute so hold on to that idea but the more you do bad though the more the good is forgotten so then that brings us to um the next logical step in this puzzle that um maybe i've thought too much about huh <laughs> what is good a lot of a lot of our sunday school stuff it, it focuses on more of the idea of teaching our kids to be good be better Christianity is so focused on being gooder. <laughs> but the the problem is is that the question is unanswered. What is good? And why is it good? If we're going on, on an argument with an atheist, for instance, they're going to say, well, I can do good things. What is good? Without the existence of God, is there such a thing as good? Or is it nothing more than my own my own bias? What's right... To, and good to one is right, isn't right. Here's a good example, and we'll look at this at the very end. To an atheist, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your whole soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, that's stupid. That's that's not a morally good thing. That's just, oh, that's just a religious thing. But to a Christian, that is the heart and the soul of morals and ethics and goodness. Keeping in mind, once again, though, that God alone is good. So, with that being said, you can see the big variety there. So what is good? Some people think it's something that we do. Some people think it's something that we are. Now, let's let's think about this. If goodness is something that we do, 
then Hitler himself wasn't necessarily bad. He did some bad things, but he could have also done good things. Maybe if he would have lived a little bit longer, we would have seen more good things than bad things. And maybe those good things would have outdone all the genocide that he did. This is sarcasm. Um, we can tell right there that goodness can't be something that we do. But if you talk about talk to people, they always make it out to be like, what well, well, we looked at last week with God sending good, quote-unquote, good people to hell. Oh, well, they did good things. But that can't possibly make you good. No amount of doing good things can possibly make you good. So then, it, surely goodness must be something that we are. Well, then no one is good. If, if goodness is nothing more than something that we are, then there's four reasons why none of us can ever be good. Number one, we sin. We mess up. We do the wrong thing. Anybody here going to try and argue that? No? Didn't think so. Number two, we can sin. We have, the in a, we have the ability in us to do the wrong thing. God is incapable of doing a bad thing because he is wholly good. So those are two big important things right there. Number three, we are often unaware of our sin. That means we have ignorance in us of doing the wrong thing sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes we do something wrong, ignorant that it is wrong. How can we possibly be good if we are unable to distinguish good from bad? If there is a realm of unknowability in us, then that means that we will be lost in that realm and unable to, to further reach our goal of goodness. Once again, a little bit more philosophical than usual, but it's a very important point to make anyways. Number four, we can do nothing to remove our sin. Even saying that we could possibly not sin, which is impossible, but let's say that we could, and we could overcome our human nature and be incapable of sin in the future, and we are unaware of our, and we are suddenly able to become aware of all sin and all knowability that is knowable. That brings us to the fourth problem: we can do nothing to remove it, though. Nothing we do can remove our sin. We are still sinners. So then that takes us to the idea of God and how goodness necessitates the existence of a God. Our conscience itself says that there is such a thing as good. We know inherently that beating a child is wrong. We know inherently that murdering someone and taking something that's not ours, these are things that we don't have to be told, hey, that's bad. We just know in us that that's bad. If I go anywhere in the world and just start taking somebody's stuff and, and, and beating people up, I mean, they're going to say, hey, that's a bad thing to do. I mean, even if you go to like the African tribal people who don't really have the idea of ownership, I can still go there and I can take their hunting steer and break it and throw it on the ground. And then I can start beating one of them up. And then the other one will say, this is a bad thing that you were doing. This is, this is uh, something that, that is not exclusive to one society. It's all people. So then it, 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 that brings us to the idea of God. God then has to be the ultimate of perfection for good to really truly exist. Anything less would be, well, then he's not good. And then goodness itself doesn't exist. So if God is good, I'm sorry, let me say that differently. God then is good. He always has been. And he is a source of good. That means goodness is his standard of right and wrong. A lot of times with Christianity, people focus on the idea of being a better person, doing, doing the right thing. We looked at that last week, and I've mentioned it quite a few times today already. But the thing is, I may not need God to do a good thing. I looked at this a little bit on Sunday morning when I, when I talked about that passage um, from John chapter 10. I don't really need God's help to do a good thing. I can... Even as an atheist, I can go out and do a good thing. I can go outside and help an old person cross the street, for instance. I don't, I don't need God and a guilt trip to tell me to do that. But oftentimes, Christianity is reduced to this reason for doing good. And that's not really what it's about. You may not need God to do a good thing, but goodness isn't the goal. That means that you are going to mess up, and you have to realize that you're going to mess up, and be okay with the fact that you're going to mess up without... Messing up on purpose. <laughs> Doing good things doesn't change someone and make them good. So let's let's look at that a little bit more. I let's say a, a rapist. Doing good things is what a rapist who's doing good things. Okay, a rapist who stopped doing rape, who stopped raping, that would be a rapist who's on break. 
they're still they're still a rapist. They have raped. They that is that is a defining uh, defining trait. Let's let's move to something else. A druggie doing good things. You have a drug that what is that? That's a druggie doing good things. A druggie who stops doing drugs is a druggie who's on break. Well, so that brings up the obvious question: Are they doomed to repeat the behavior because that's who they used to be? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that you're doomed to that failure, and that's kind of my point. Sometimes people push Christianity to like it's only valid as a means of bettering yourself. If you're a druggie, you want to change your life, you get saved, so you won't be a druggie anymore. Well, hold on, you can get off drugs without without being saved. I've seen people do it. And that brings us to an argument that I actually have a lot of times. In fact, I just had it later, uh, earlier on this week. Um, this one right here. So long as I'm no longer doing drugs, I don't really need to go to church. It's just not really for me. I'm off drugs. That's good enough. Well, getting off of drugs wasn't really the goal. The goal was being made right before God. See, goodness, I, I have attained goodness by myself. I don't need to go to church. I don't need that whole God thing. I was able to better myself by myself. I, only people who can't better themselves by themselves need to go to church. See, see, the, see the disconnect there. And it's not even the point. Stopping doing something doesn't heal you. It doesn't, it doesn't remove the sin. It doesn't equal forgiveness. Oh, I no longer rape people. You still have raped. I no longer do drugs. You have still done. See what I mean? It's it stopping doing the action doesn't ex erase the past from existence. So it doesn't bring us healing and it doesn't bring us forgiveness. But with that being said, this is also a, a flip 180 of that. Is it's also extremely good news because that means that when we inevitably fell, which we will, we don't have to say this. I am so terrible because I did blank again. I masturbated again i looked at porn again i did drugs again i you know fill in the blank whatever it is i don't have to feel bad about it any, anymore because you know obviously you hopefully we're growing hopefully we're growing but my salvation is not dependent on my perfection and so that brings us to the idea of two kinds of people in the world there's not perfect and imperfect there's not better and worse there's saved or unsaved what was the heart of Hitler's problem? He was not submitted to God. He was not saved. That was the root of the problem. His bitterness consumed him, and that's what happened. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that, well, he just had bad parents. No, no, no. It's not just our environment that makes us do bad things. We also choose to do bad things. And this brings up a very important debate that a lot of Christians say they believe with their mouths, but they don't actually believe it in their hearts. Are we saved by grace or our goodness? Well, I'm saved by grace. So then why do you have the, have the need to guilt trip yourself every time that you mess up? Because I messed up again. But you're not saved by your goodness. You're saved by grace. Saved people mess up, and, un and unsaved people mess up too. Everybody messes up. There should be a change happening in your life, yes, but perfection... No. So let's look at some things that the Bible has to say, and this will kind of uh, build on what I'm talking about. First off, remember that I s said no amount of good things undoes a bad thing. But when you start doing bad things, people start to lose sight of the good that you've done because the bad just becomes so overwhelming. Well, now let's look at the idea of righteousness itself. Um, if a righteous person turns from the righteous from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable thing the wicked person does, none of the righteous things the person has done will be remembered. So what he just said is, if I turn from God, my righteousness will be forgotten. Okay, let's keep on with this idea. Because of the sins they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all, all my decrees and, and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. They will not die. So we have a wicked person turns to God. The, the evil is not, for, is not remembered. So that takes us to a past idea of doing a good thing or doing a bad thing to the idea of righteousness before God, rightness before God. That means no matter what I've done, he clears the slate. It also means that apart from him, if I turn from him, whatever good that I have done, pointless. It doesn't count. Which brings up another little interesting point, and I want to emphasize this because people don't really get this. 
God rejects a good deed done from a wicked heart. If you are in rebellion to God, doing a good thing does not like God's all like, well, okay, well, he's in rebellion to me and, and you know, he's, he's, you know, in need of salvation, but it's okay. Uh, but it's okay because he did a good thing. Well, that's not really how it works. God rejects when, 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 when bad people do good things. It's like this. We think we can buy God's forgiveness by doing enough good. We want to buy our salvation, buy our forgiveness, but make it we're, – we're not as bad as, as – you know, it's, we're just not all that bad because we do good things. But God isn't bought. It's this very similar thing as when Christians do a fast oftentimes. Not all the time, but oftentimes when Christians do the fast, they think that God now somehow owes them because they've gone, done something above and beyond what was required. Therefore, they're worthy of something more, and that's just not really how it works. So forgiveness erases bad, but bad erases good done. And then we get to John, 1 John 1, 6. It says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So this is more talking about the way that it, we are not given a get out of free jail card that we can just live however we want. Um, Ephesians 2, 10. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We brought up this up last week, the idea of Christians are no more than social workers, um, bringing up the whole idea of social gospel and all that. Here's the thing. It's not saying – hey, Isaiah did come. Woo. Um, it is not saying that our only purpose and the purpose of existence is doing good works. So, hey, as long as I do good things, I'm a good Christian, and you know that's it. Well, that would be salvation by works. So we know that that's not what he's saying. Rather, what he's saying is God didn't save us so we could do whatever we want. God didn't save us so we could live foolishly. Get, that's that's completely, completely – no. God, our salvation doesn't mean that we should do whatever we want. Our salvation instead means that we should be doing the good works. And then also James 2.17 builds on this too. So also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. The idea that faith should be producing uh, works. Matthew 7.23. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers, people who are doing bad things. So Christianity does produce good works. But, but good works are not the point of Christianity. Christianity is more than just a social gospel. It's more than just, you know, uh, being social workers who go out and, and do a good thing for people. It's more than that. It's not about being better. So what qualifies as good works? Well, see, this is where the, pro the problem between, uh, between an atheist and a Christian. Oh, fr good works have to flow from obedience to God, not, not as a substitute to obedience to God. And trying to buy God and manipulate him by goodness is, is, I mean, really a very evil thing to do. So we have doing good plus doing it with rebellion towards God is evil. So here's just a few more ideas that we want to look at before we close out these specifically two, thing, two main points here. First off. And we've talked about this in length in other, in other lessons, so I just want to kind of add to it as we're getting ready to next week. We'll close out this, this series. Right and wrong have to be absolute, or they really aren't right and wrong. If right, if, if right really means anything, it has to be an absolute standard. It can't be something based off of my, my own limited understanding or my society at the time. Like right now. In our society, there are certain key topics that everybody's like all heated up about, right? Uh, before it was some stuff to do with Trump, and now it's stuff to do with Biden and economics and all these different things. And things that people get all excited about. Well, in another 20 years, there'll be other things that people are all worked up about. And our society will continue to change. Some things for the better, some things for the worse. But either way, they're still going to change. And... So goodness, right and wrong, can't be based off of that. Those things change. In order for something to really truly be right or wrong, it has to be an absolute standard of right and wrong. So then if truth is relative, which is my own truth or your own truth, I can just pick my own truth. And you know, ultimately, it's not right or wrong. It's you say it's right or you say it's wrong. So for instance, you know um, – Having sex with animals, that's not wrong. You just have a squeamish stomach. That's your problem, not mine. Well, see what I mean? Without an absolute standard, 
it, that's all it comes down to is who can yell the loudest, who can give the most persuasive argument. Uh, if you want to learn, if you want to see that, just go to go to. There's a lot of a lot of re really popular YouTubers who I mean they just basically they're good at yelling and playing on people's emotions and it's just like so you have no standard for this it's just something that you're doing um so um uh, truth cannot be absolute if it originates from myself or my my feelings or if it originates from my society that brings up the idea of the law which we'll look at next week so put a pin on that um so if there is a God, then His standards are absolute, and that's kind of what I want to what I want to bring out. Last week, the p main point was really pretty much that that we aren't good. This week, the main point that I want to really bring out is the idea that God has to be the standard of what is good. So if there is a God, then His standards would have to be absolute, because He would be unchanging and the originator of right and wrong. That brings us to something that a very popular atheist uh, argued. His name was Hutchins. He, he said this, what, what moral thing, and I, I'm sure many of you have probably already heard this, um, what moral thing can, can, a, can a Christian do that an atheist cannot do? The, the implication there would be nothing. You know, it, We can all do the same moral things, which I really do get what he's saying, but the problem is, is that's not totally accurate. Because first off, if you're doing a good thing from an evil heart, that's a bad thing. So if an atheist doesn't have his right, his heart right with God, how can he possibly do a good thing? How can God possibly accept a sacrifice that is not holy? How can he possibly, a, a holy and pure God, accept a sacrifice? Well, then the atheist would just say, well, it's just a moral thing. There is no God. But if there is no God, then there is no moral thing. It is just a person's opinion, something that your society has impressed upon you. That's it. So then there is no right or wrong thing. So then what moral thing can a Christian do that an atheist can't? Nothing, because there is no such thing as morality. So I can do whatever I wish, and there is no, no consequence, because nothing is moral. But another thing that, that, that Christians can do, that atheists cannot do that, that is moral, and I brought this up at the very beginning of the lesson, is love God. Loving God is moral because God, who is himself the source of morality, which makes it absolute, says that it is according to his own character, and he cannot lie. And it is the basis for every other moral and the reason why I shouldn't live however I want. So let's, let's kind of build on that. If it's the basis for every other moral and the reason why I shouldn't live however I want, let, let's, put some, let's, let's kind of build on this. That would mean that I love people because I love God. Now, this might seem like, oh, that's – that's you know, you're just arguing over semantics. But actually, it's a very, a very, very big point because of this. Human love is always limited by our own experience. You have somebody who's been divorced, right? They're, when they first go into, into that first relationship, they had a lot of hopes and dreams. They get divorced. They get remarried. Less hopes and dreams. More stubborn, less willing to bend, already kind of accepted the fact that it's going to end in divorce before it even does. And so on and so forth. The more people they marry, the, the higher chances that they'll get divorced. Your first marriage is the one you are most likely to have succeed. If you divorce and remarry, it dro drops drastically. And it keeps going like that, dropping even lower and lower and lower. The chances are the more you get divorced, the less likely you are to ever have a, have a happy, fulfilling marriage. Um... Our human love is always limited by our experience. Uh, I could give you ex uh, examples of this as a pastor. So, you know, I dealt with this person. I tried. I really did try. They still were a pain in the butt. They never changed. So then this other person comes by. They're going to do the exact same thing. I'm not going to try as hard because I already know how the story is going to end. Then another person comes by. Well, you know, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. See what I mean? I have limited my love towards someone because of past experience. That's human nature. That's something we all do. It's something that we might not like that we do it, but it still happens regardless. And so now let's take us to the point of Christians where Christians, as obedience to God, push past that and love and forgive when it doesn't make sense. A lot of times we have reason to hate people. We have reason to hate those who hurt us. Good reasons. 
but in Christ we are told to forgive. In the world we're told to hold on, protect ourselves, all this different stuff, but in Christ it's different. I once saw a guy go to court. This guy had murdered, murdered his child. Literally, there was no other way of saying it. It was brutal, it was gross, it was disgusting. He goes to court and he says, hey, I forgive you. That does not make sense. It does not make sense. In the in the world's eyes, it's string him up, kill him. You know, he, he gets it, he deserves it, and, and absolutely that's right. Logic is even on your side. But with Christ, it changes things. He had no right to hold on to offense because Christ didn't hold on to his offense. Greatly he was forgiven, so greatly he had to forgive. That's just the way of Christ. It doesn't make sense, but it's the way of Christ. But in our human human understanding, love is always limited. Atheists, no matter how hard they try, they will always be limited in their love because it will always reach ahead eventually. The problem is, is that Christians also struggle with loving people, but instead of admitting that, they pretend like they don't have a problem and they secretly hate people that they don't like. They just make it seem like they're better because they have to be better. <laughs> It's too hard to love, fill in the blank, them. So that brings us to three very important important thoughts about, for, about loving people. First off, why not give up on them? Why shouldn't I give up on that person? I know they're not going to change their pain in the butt. I only have to love them so long as they change. That's how our marriages work. That's how our lives work. That's how our relationships work. That's how the world works. That's totally reasonable. It makes logical sense. It does not match up to the Bible. The first question that the atheist would answer differently than a Christian, or how a Christian should answer it. The second one, what if they don't deserve it? Surely I only have to forgive people who deserve it. We don't have to love Hitler. It's okay to hate Hitler. He's a bad person. He did bad things. That makes sense. The atheist would say, yes, I do not love Hitler. But as a Christian, we are, we are told to forgive our enemies, to love, to pray for. That doesn't make sense. It's countercultural. It's counter-natural. So then that brings us to the third thing that when we, when we see most broadly, the atheist answers the same way as a Christian does. Yes, I can do a good thing by loving people. But when it gets down to the nitty and gritty, Christians are called to go a step above, a step beyond. Something that, that, that the atheist does not see the reason for, so they will not take that same step. And the third one, what if I don't feel like it? I don't. It's okay if I hate my ex because they're my ex. I don't have to love them. They did, they did wrong by me. I hate their guts. That makes sense to the world. I don't feel like loving and forgiving. They're my ex. But for a Christian, we are told to forgive even our ex. See what I mean? Now that that takes us to a whole nother world. For that, a lot of Christians can't even embrace this. They say, "Oh no, God loves me. He loves my mess, and I am not. I don't have to forgive anybody." I was like, "Well, actually, God said that if we don't forgive, then He won't forgive, and He didn't stutter at all." So those are just three simple applications, very much so more difficult than Hutchins made it out to be. the The problem with with common Atheist people like Hutchins and, and Dawkins, they say things very rapidly and they lose you in, in, in saying it quickly. And then if you actually stop and think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and it doesn't really stand up. But because they said it so fast and so flawlessly, it very, gets very intimidating. Um, so what is, our, what is our reason? You know, okay, well, looking at porn is bad. Well, okay, is it though? Why is it bad? I, don't look at, I won't look at porn because, because why? See, so without God, there really is no grounding there. And a lot of people nowadays will even tell you porn isn't that bad. It's not a big deal to look at porn. Hey, it's not hurting anybody, which isn't true, but, you know, it's a common idea out there. So, all, the main point of, of this week is that God is a source and originator, originator of good. And, uh, yeah, so next week we'll, we'll look at the, at the few last things and we'll wrap up this discussion on goodness. And then the week after that we'll look at... Um, uh, the prophet Obadiah. Uh, probably be on him for a week or two. Were there any questions? Any comments? Okay.